All right, everybody, welcome. Welcome to uh, our uh, next installment of the Nanswedo Colloquia. We're really uh, pleased and lucky to have with us today Robert Vargas, who is a, a sociologist and also uh, deputy dean uh, here at the university. Uh, Robert is uh, interested in research on cities, law, and race. His writing and teaching focus on identifying political economic forces shaping neighborhood conditions, as well as city responses to social problems. He's published in many, many journals, such as Social Problems, Criminology, and Social Science of Medicine. He's won uh, numerous awards, such as a career award from NSF. His research has been featured in many uh, popular media outlets, including NBC, Telemundo, Univision, the Tribune, Talk Magazine, and NPR. So it's our distinct pleasure to welcome uh, Robert uh, today. It's the floor of the Okay. Uh, first, I would like to acknowledge everything that I'm going to share is a team effort. Amazing team of a research staff, full time research staff, student research assistants, and also these, uh, these funders. Start off with a little quiz that I'm not going to force you to answer, but in your heads, I'd like you to answer to yourself. When was the last time? The U.S. abolished a piece of the policing and criminal justice system. 159 years ago, 102, 11, or a year. And the answer to a year ago, you'd be correct, because the state of Illinois, and the Safety Act, and the, the Pretrial Fairness Act essentially abolished money bail in the state. Um, and I love starting out with it because I think abolition is thought as some sort of Behind the sky idea. There's a long history of abolition in the country, and abolition is thought, abolition is social science, and it's still being practiced today. So, what is an abolition? A lot of different ideas on it. What I'm using to anchor my work is Allegra McLeod's definition, defining it as a set of principles and positive projects oriented toward substituting a constellation of other regulatory and social projects for criminal law. Um, there, there are many strands of abolitionist thought, but I'm, and I'm not going to go over all of them. But um, what I think is really, what I find very generative about this approach is that it's cast as transforming state and society relations and is in direct response to what's called reformism. It tweaks in the criminal justice or policing systems. Uh, and because part of the weaknesses of the reformist approach is that it doesn't transform state power or systems and instead works through state power to, in an effort to restore societal order as opposed to transform it. And what's really key, the key concept that I'm working with here is the non-reformist block. It's a concept that was actually uh, uh, produced by Andre Gores, a critical social theorist that Ruth Wilson Gilmore then built off of. And so this is Gilmore's uh, definition of a reform that, that works to unravel rather than widen the net of social control through criminalization. And what I think is really uh, powerful to note about this perspective, reading Gilmore's writing and the writings of Amna Akbar, is that the non-reformist reform is thought of as an alternative approach to revolution or armed insurrection as a way of trying to achieve abolition. And Non-reformist reforms have a long-term and gradual. The idea isn't to just flick a switch, remove all aspects of the criminal justice system and replace it with something. It's in some ways an incremental approach looking to replace all the different uh, responsibilities that the criminal justice system operates and replace them with, with an alternative, a more positive oriented alternative. And I'll say, I'll give a few, I'll give a few minutes to talk about my, how I have arrived at uh, thinking with abolitionists. It's, it's been through reading the work of sociologist Dorothy Roberts, who's just a, a titan of a sociologist uh, at UPenn. And in, in the introduction to her book, um, uh, Torn Apart, which is where she makes an argument for abolishing the system of family policing, this passage really struck me. This is like, I was reading this right around the time I got tenure, which is 
I've lost count of the trainings of caseworkers, administrators, lawyers, and judges, court volunteers that I've conducted in the last 20 years confronting disparities and biases. Wrote articles for journals, for philanthropy, uh, uh, policies that destroyed black families. None, none rendered a significant blow to the system's fundamental design. And this really struck me because I was at a stage in my career where I'm also being approached by different institutions to write similar reports. And so reading this and seeing that, I'm just, I, I, I have to chart a, a different path forward from what my colleagues are doing in this space. And I should make a note, yeah. Bear with me. I could keep going. So like, I think that, you know, this is a really, really, really sensitive debate for many reasons. And I, oops, I think it's yeah. gonna just it up. <laughs> And I think that there's, there are ways to bring more people to the table around this perspective, um, because I certainly wouldn't define abolition as anti-police, that I think it's fair to say, oh, that's, that says uh, a pragmatic case for abolition, which is if we accept, I think many folks can agree that society asks police to do too much. That's kind of what this slide is trying to emphasize. There are police leaders who have said in media, the police are asked to do too much, do the job of a social worker, a mental health worker, uh, a teacher, parent, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Um, I, I should also say too that um, in Turkey, there, there are arguments to be made that replacing certain responsibilities that the police are involved in might actually free up the police to focus more on the things that are the highest priority for them. And um, I could go more into this if you like, but um, just pushing that out. So what I'm going to talk about today uh, are a set of projects oriented around the question, uh, what are the barriers and facilitators of public safety? And what I'm doing here is trying to advance an empirical abolitionist sociology by thinking of it as an innovation challenge. In other words, thinking about non-reformist reforms as innovations, and therefore engaging with the literatures on science studies, literatures on urban innovation, and, and the arts, so I won't go into that. To try and think about, okay, how do we implement non-reformist reforms? Um, and uh, what are the barriers to, to implement? And so I'll be talking about three specific kinds of barriers and then shed light on some of the facilitators of non-reformist reforms. Uh, so study one has to do with academic propaganda. And so this started off with a paper uh, motivated by the role that science plays and, uh, and sometimes operating as a barrier to innovation in public safety space. And so the question that ignited the inquiry here was, what did policing research look like during the emergence of the Black Lives Matter movement, roughly from 2011 to 2022, in which studies received the most media coverage? And so to produce a sample of studies to work with, uh, we, sorry, let's just start here. We started with three funding agencies, the National Institute of Justice, the uh, Arnold Foundation, which is now Ventures, and the MacArthur Foundation, to three of the most reputable funders of policing research, certainly not the only ones, but the ones that have uh, shared uh, public da databases of what they fund, not all funders are transparent about this. And so we scraped the grant information provided to uh, the principal investigators, uh, used the grant ID to find all of the publications produced from the grant finding, and then arrived at a sample of 144 studies. And um, this is not representative of the entire field of policing research uh, as a whole, but I would argue that it's a sample that I drew in part to try and select on what would be deemed as the higher quality uh, policing studies, because these are very reputable funders that fund things through peer review, uh, which, uh, if you trust me for a second, the, the, the lower you go down in the funding world, the lower the quality of the studies, but happy to talk about that. 
So what we did with, with these 144 studies was we used the, the DOI of the publication to search in the altmetric database for the media mentions of these studies. It gives you counts of the number of news articles, tweets. And then we filed, engaged in a massive Freedom of Information Act. All of the memorandum of understandings are contracts signed between academics and police departments to make these studies happen. I'll explain why that's important. And so for this, I owe a lot to my collaborators at Lucy Parsons Labs, which are an activist organization that are FOIA wizards. Like, um, as, as I, I'll mention this in the conclusion, that I think one of the reasons to bring activists to the table in terms of conversations around how to collect independent data on police is that they know how to file FOIAs. By and large, in the social science classes I took in graduate school, there was nothing on FOIA or the, or the role of litigation in getting government data. And so this was the Airtable system that we set up of 10 RAs, each devoted to filing FOIAs for, I want to say, 20 or so police departments. Uh, it was a long, extensive process, but after a year, we were able to get uh, 30 contracts. So we analyzed the data. Um, all of the papers read, read the paper, the group of us read the papers several times, uh, coded the media mentions, coded the MOUs. I should also say that I had lengthy conversations with legal scholars, uh, the former CEOs of major private evaluation firms, and uh, University Legal Council of from certain local universities, I won't say which ones, uh, to make sense of, of, of these MOUs, of these contracts. And so what are we from? Academic propaganda. And what I mean by this are studies explicitly contesting social movement claims around defunding or abolition uh, in ways that uh, where the authors masked their conflict of interest and were also espousing police epistemology. And by police epistemology, I, I, I mean like the police standpoint, police viewpoint on the issue. Now, why propaganda? So I don't use the term propaganda like I actually searched in many different literatures for different ways to conceive of this. I talked to my colleagues who are science study scholars like Karen Norsetina and James Evans, and they said, no, this isn't quite the epistemic culture. There was some sort of scientific science of science. And then I came across the work of philosopher Jason Stanley, who wrote this phenomenal book on you know, propaganda, which I would recommend all of you to read. It's, it's, it's an amazing book, where he offers a really uh, powerful definition of propaganda in today's context, which he calls a, a masking which is the use of liberal democratic ideals to cover up significant gaps between one's ideals and reality. And the example that he uses here is of Samuel Huntington, the Harvard political scientist of the 1960s, who in response to the civil, move, civil rights movement uh, was arguing for the US to adopt a more technocratic um, uh, method of governance where uh, social scientists were put in the positions of evaluating and creating policies because the idea was that civil rights movement activists didn't have the proper expertise or credentials to run a particular kind of group. Stanley refers to that kind of logic as a masking propaganda because it's using the logic of positivism to, uh, to ultimately propose a way of governing cities that is undemocratic because social scientists aren't elected, right, to create these policies. Um, and so what do the conflicts of interest look like here? Uh, so these are, this is part of why we do the FOIA work with the contracts. So these are uh, contracts that impinge on researchers' academic freedom, I'm looking at the details of the MOUs that enable these studies to happen, but also just simple positionality conflicts, which are researchers that are not disclosing the fact that they both contract for and evaluate police it's important to say what is not academic. So studies that are applied and, and that are not attempting to mask this, are I wouldn't deem propaganda. So I use this as an example. A randomized control trial that tried to evaluate the effects of smartphones on a police department's ability to make arrests. The smartphones were transparent, open about their objectives. There's no masking 
So in our, according to our coding, this was not academic. So the good news is that most policing research is not academic propaganda. So the red line here are propaganda studies, the blue are not. But by and large, it's like roughly 20% of the studies of sample we can be coded uh, inductively as, as being academic propaganda. But after 2020, media mentions of the propaganda uh, skyrocket, while the non-propaganda studies lack. And there are a handful of studies that were responsible for this. Uh, the first was this study published by researchers at George Mason that sought to de delegitimize the social movement discourse around defunding police, posing this descriptive question, can we really defund the police? And the paper was just a descriptive paper that made use of 911 call data to chart out all of the different responsibilities that police were involved in and say that well, if you defunded the police, what's going to happen to all of these responsibilities? The authors uh, masked themselves in objectivity, saying in the introduction, flat out, as scientists, we do not advocate for or against defunding the police, but point out that the debate has proceeded without adequate research, yada, yada, yada. They, they, they didn't cite or engage with any of the social science of done by scholars or activists that has actually engaged and actually has answers and has a plan for this insight any of that. Nor did they note the fact that their largest funder is a White House program that has given them nearly $25 million in funding to do intelligence anal analysis and manage projects for police departments all across the Northeast corridor. They don't disclose this conflict of interest. And so in the rest of the paper, they go on to argue that um, you know, only 4% of the 911 calls in their database were related to mental health concerns. Therefore, arguments for investing in mental health actually don't seem to be all that great of an idea. There's many reasons to dispute the 4% figure and why it would be a drastic undercount of the amount of demand for mental health services. Uh, but uh, regardless of what one evaluate, how one evaluates that claim, the 4% figure in this paper was cited in a debate between Brandon Johnson and Paul Vellis by the debate monitor saying, well, only according to a study, only 4% of mental health calls or police calls are related to this. Therefore, does it make sense to actually support the treatment, not trauma campaign, which was this effort, this platform that the mayor ran on um, to invest in mental health infrastructure. And so the study had 160 news media mentions and um, certainly had influence on public discourse. Another form of academic propaganda mythologizes police training effectiveness. So this was a study that came out in the proceedings of the National Academies, again by uh, researchers at George Mason, but a handful of other institutions, where they did a multi-city randomized controlled trial, a police training called procedural justice training, which essentially teaches the value, teaches to police officers the value of engaging with citizens in a respectful manner, teaches them that uh, citizen perceptions of police matter for uh, garnering community members uh, cooperation with investigations. And they randomized officers that participated in the training, but also randomized the locations where those officers were assigned. And it was framed as like the first real rigorous RCT of procedural justice training, because up to this point, the National Academies had issued a report saying that the scientific evidence around the effectiveness of these trainings is mixed. When you look at very closely the 80 page methodological appendix accompanying the study, the authors admit that they encourage department leadership to choose the officers who have participated in the experiment. And then after having received the list of officers in each department, just eight in Tucson, 12 in Cambridge, which by the way, the, the study claimed to find all these positive effects of the training. Um, and so it was randomization, but it was randomization of a selected sample. Why does this matter? Well, aside from obvious selection bias issues here, the literature on police misconduct shows that police misconduct is heavily clustered in subnetworks within police departments. 
And so it's not, it's not clear how much external validity this RCT even has. I would argue that it also questions the internal validity of the study, depending on how you're defining police here. But setting that question aside, the idea here is that these, these um, are far from the best randomized controlled trials. Looking at the contract that enabled this study to happen in the first place showed that this element of the research design was baked in from the start, that this was a condition that the police department and the researchers uh, negotiated for this, this study to even proceed. So for those who can't read, so Houston Police Department will identify a minimum of four officers from the department to coordinate interventions, each of the two treatment groups, for a total of at least eight officers. Another important uh, note of this contract was that it governed the author's um, engagement with the media. So with respect to publicity, the parties agree that they will communicate with each other when a press inquiry was made about the results of the finding. And then to the extent permissible, consultants with the media. The study had 40 media mentions. The representative of the funder um, of the study mm -hmm. was quoted saying that the police departments across the country should learn from these results and require high quality procedural justice training. A closer look at the 40 media mentions kept on popping up this mind PR newswire, which my coders couldn't quite figure out. Um, but upon closer inspection, it turns out that PR newswire is a PR firm that uh, one of the authors contracted with that uh, has a network of relations with local news outlets. So this is the Myrtle Beach, South Carolina affiliate of Boston <laughs> News that. Um, Put out this study. And so what it is, is these are press releases that are made to look like local, mes local news media coverage. Because the main giveaway here is that the author of the news article, Palmer, is chief of staff for the National Policing Institute. And so to recap here, uh, academic propaganda was just 21% of the police studies, but accounted for 60% of the media coverage for this, of the studies in this, in this sample after 2020. And I think getting back to abolition and non reformist reforms points to how during a police legitimacy crisis, like we saw in 2020, philanthropically funded academic propaganda discredits a lot of social movement frames under the guise of objective science. And this is not just any journal, this is the proceedings of the National Academy. It's a uh, highly reputable journal, although depending on which academics you talk to. Mm -hmm. Study two. Uh, the, the evidence-based paradigm and it's it, how, how it inhibits innovation. And so for this study, we focused on randomized controlled trials. Again, from these three funders, but RCTs of police compared to RCTs of violence prevention programs. And then again, comparing the media coverage of the two. And so what is the evidence-based paradigm? That's like the subject of the paper. Uh, the evidence-based paradigm is a movement in social science of a certain branch of policy research that heavily uses tools of evaluation towards interventions or trainings, all with the idea that we should be implementing what works based on objective evidence, which I think sounds great in principle. And it kind of operates with this model of science that social scientists should be like umpires, just calling balls and strikes and not having a skin in the game. And what I argue is that this, not only is that logic unrealistic, it's actually <laughs> incrementalism disguised as positivism. So it claims to not have a normative, a, a normative stance on these things. But when you read very, very closely, some of the authors working the evidence-based paradigm, they're, they don't, uh, they're not open about this in, every, in all the spaces where they, they present, but in, in, in your books, they, they're open about um, like fundamental, fundamental social change or systemic social change not being the objective here. So Braga and Cook in their book argue that we're confident that serious violence rates and things related to policing can change dramatically even without fundamental social change. And then Cook and Ludwig argue that there's plenty of evidence that incremental social policies have made the world a better place and that the evidence base for bold and broad interventions is often non-existent. And I make this, I, I highlight these quotes to say that like, this is not just umpires calling balls and strikes. 
this is an enterprise that is, is at least in some spaces, transparent about being incrementalist in approaching you know, society's biggest problems. I think one of the problems with this is when you look at the high, what's, what many consider the highest evaluation standard, the gold standard, is that violence prevention programs are subjected to six times more RCTs than police, at least in, in this database of funders. And that it's largely the National Institute of Justice that's driving this. And look, I talked to plenty of policing scholars who say they would love to do an RCT of everything in police. It's just that the police won't let them, or at least they will, under, the, un, under terms of the kinds of contracts that I shared with you. And so another important finding here is that the results of these RCTs skew positive for police, uh, but mixed for violence prevention. So blue are policing RCTs. So we see a lot more strong uh, findings the RCT for police, more mixed for violence prevention. Sorry, Robert, can you just clarify the distinction between, I don't fully understand violence prevention versus policing. Can you just say what question? What yeah, so a violence prevention uh, RCT is an evaluation of cognitive behavioral therapy, street outreach programs, anti-bullying programs. Like these are projects that have the term violence prevention in as, as a keyword in the grant and in the paper. Versus, and what would be just a police These are evaluations of largely of body worn cameras, procedural justice training, and taser usage. Yeah. So newer policing RCTs with more plus, but more media coverage. And so the issue of supervisor selection that I talked about in, in the Weinsberg article, appeared in six of the eight policing RCTs. I should say that there are some really great policing RCTs out there where they obtained a list, a full roster of the police officers in the department and then used a random number generator to assign uh, officers to treatment and control. That, that was by and large not the norm, but also those studies did not get anywhere near as much media attention as some of these other RCTs. Interest of time. Okay. So to recap, uh, police departments and their hand chosen researchers can manufacture the appearance of effectiveness, while policing alternatives are disproportionately subjected to the highest and more independent evaluation standards. And so, getting back to the critique of the evidence based paradigm, I think one really big shortcoming of this is that the evidence based paradigm turns a blind eye to powerful institutions that have the capability of putting, erecting a wall essentially that prevent them from being evaluated. An example of this are policing or various arms of privatized police. And generally any, any of the claims that police tend to make about crime. Uh, and what I mean by this is in, over the course of 2020, when crime was increasing, the city's administration was arguing that it was uh, lenient judges who are letting people out of jail to lenient people. By and large, folks working in the evidence-based paradigm were silent and were not evaluating this claim by the administration. And so this is this relates to uh, a third study, uh, which is uh, a <laughs> fourth. Uh, the third study that I'm focused on here, which is uh, the undone science. So one way that science studies talk about, science studies scholars talk about um, research that's really important, that doesn't end up being done because of the power uh, dynamics insulating them, is the, the concept of undone science. And I think that um, the privatization of police policy is a really important area of undone science and one that the evidence-based paradigm completely glosses over because the evidence-based approach essentially depends on high degrees of trust with the agency that they're evaluating. And so uh, what I'm talking about here with privatization of police policy, this is probably new to most of you, which are private firms, not government, but private firms that draft use of force guidelines for police departments and sell them to police departments. So in 2020, 
One of the responses to the killing of George Floyd that states implemented was requiring police departments to have written guidelines of when use of force can be used. Better to have some guidelines than none. So what happened here was firms formed by retired police officers drafted these policies and sold them to departments across the country. None have been evaluated, none. And there's no way of knowing the scale at which these firms are selling to police departments. Um, and, so the, and so one really simple descriptive question that my team is getting at here is like, what is the scale, at least of the sale of these policies? And through some of the work that we've been doing so far, we're finding that um, it's at least a 31% market share, meaning 31, there are 18,000 police departments in the country. We've found through FOIA requests and all sorts of collaborations that I can get into uh, later that, uh, and this is likely an underestimate because we're still filing, working on filing the FOIAs. It's a massive, massive, massive effort that I could probably report back to you in four years, um, but we're getting there. Um, and so when I saw this figure, it, it really just like, it really, really hit me because, you know, I, I think that, most of my colleagues working in the evidence-based paradigm, I think are doing and approaching that work from the right place, but the structures are not aligned there to allow them to evaluate the things that need to be evaluated the most. And so while I thought for a while that the evidence-based paradigm was, was the problem, I thought to myself, no, actually, the problem is how do we steer the evidence-based paradigm to focus on what is currently, what was currently impossible to evaluate? Uh, and so that's the direction that, that this is. So last study is uh, towards something a little bit more positive, hopeful, I hope, is what facilitates non-reformist reforms. And so what we're looking at here are cities um, that have adopted policing alternatives for the last 15 years. And we're looking at two kinds of alternatives, crisis response alternatives, which are uh, civilian led where either mental health workers or social workers are tasked with responding to uh, emergency calls that uh, police uh, usually respond to. Uh, Chicago has a co-responder model where police have to accompany a social worker, but uh, cities throughout the country have been implementing uh, like mental health worker only response models. And another is the creation of municipal offices of violence prevention and neighborhood safety. These are new city government agencies tasked with bringing together and coordinating the world of nonprofits and social interventions as a way to respond to violent crime. And we collected all sorts of data on 300 cities from um, their population uh, to uh, the presence of potential negative interest groups, the number of protests, uh, Black Lives Matter protests, the number of nonprofits, a variety of political indicators, just doing a, a simple uh, two-way fixed effects model, uh, re uh, logistic regression model, uh, trying to get at the factors associated with innovations. Not making arguments about causality here, but um, just trying to get at some descriptive indicators. And one important um, subset that we're focusing here is uh, the notion of learning communities. And this is getting to the, to the benefits of engaging with the literature on innovation. And so the, when you read research on tech innovation, it's all about networks, like which firms are embedded in networks with other firms to, which have proximity to universities and regulators and so on. And so we, we test this idea by looking at, by, by measuring learning communities through the roster of elected officials who are members of these different policy, urban policy learning communities. Local progress is probably the most left of the organizations on this, uh, on this slide. But I think what's really important here is that these learning communities were bringing together policymakers from all over the country to think about how to build coalitions, how to draft legislation, how to pass it, all of the nuts and bolts policy work of how do you actually get these specific programs, talking specifically about crisis response alternatives and um, offices of violence prevention. And so 
Um, this is just descriptively amongst the 100 largest cities, roughly 20% have uh, CRAs, 33% have offices of violence prevention. When I saw this number, I was pleasantly surprised because I thought it would be a lot fewer. I look at this slide and I think I see something hopeful because I think what we've seen in a lot of social science and media discourse has been nothing but backlash since 2020. And I would argue, actually, that's true, but there's also been a lot of policy innovation that has been happening as a result of this. And I think that is what, uh, that, that gives us something to build, to build on. These are the cities that have been adopting these. I'll skip ahead for the sake of time. With respect to the results, we run these models dozens of ways. I'm not going to go through all the dozens of different models, but what appears consistently significant, but with like larger coefficient sizes are um, police killings. So the more police killings in a city, uh, the more likelihood, the higher the odds that the city adopted the innovation. This is for CRA, this is for office of prevention. These are logistic regressions in log odds. So above one is a, is a positive association, below one is negative. So for example, share of Trump voters, lower likelihood of having an innovation. But the biggest sizes here, which I think is really interesting, are for cities that are embedded in the learning communities. So cities that had an elected official that was a part of Cities United or Local Progress um, were more likely to innovate. But also, importantly, cities that had a consent decree. And consent decrees are DOJ uh, issued, that essentially mandate police to have reforms. And again, I think uh, in, in a lot of this space, it's really it's really easy to get cynical and think that nothing works. But like, actually, there's some some things that are working to to, to bring some changes. So to recap, uh, went over that. Yeah. Okay, some concluding thoughts, and then I get to questions. Uh, so first, I think that thinking seriously with abolition opens up different research questions. I think this is crucial because I think. Too many, I think too many folks th in this space think about this in terms of a dich dichotomy of social science and activism. Well, I would argue there are plenty of activists on the policing side that are advocating for a particular kind of view or set of investments. And I think rather than shunning abolition and throwing it and, and ignoring it in the way that I think a lot of my colleagues have, actually reading it, engaging with it, building on it, is really generative because it actually allows you to ask very different research questions. Like how can social science inform decisions amidst uncertainty in politics as opposed to certainty or as opposed to some sort of cost benefit analysis? Uh, how do we improve funders science communication? That's clearly a barrier here. And then how can social science bring activists to the table? This is my poor attempt at humor, as I'm sure many of my colleagues would be horrified at this notion. But um, I mean, when you look really closely at who's funding the policing studies and looking at their ties to police unions and various other political causes, the, the activism is, is, is there. Uh, and I think what's really crucial here, one way to tangibly pursue this is to broaden our notion of expertise. So we, often, we, we often think that technocrats, we know we have our data, I don't think that there's anything wrong with bidding, bringing community folks of all sorts. And I would, include, I would include people who are oriented to support the police. But broadening the domain of expertise to inform the questions we ask uh, so that we can innovate, assuming innovation is hard. Not always hard. Uh, abolition creates opportunities for innovation and paradigm shifts. Okay, this is getting to the science studies. And I think one really drastic paradigm shift that's needed in this space that I'm trying to push for in my work, which I'll update you on in four years because it's slow, is essentially outsourcing police duties to other agencies. And some of this has already been doing with 911 response, but I think traffic enforcement is another area that is ripe for some other kind of solution to get police out of traffic enforcement. Um, and invest is an opportunity to invest in other kinds of workforces and municipal services. And you know, to the to speak to the evidence-based paradigm, and you know, colleagues of mine that advocate for an incrementalist approach is I think folks working in that paradigm are working with this kind of notion of progress. Linear, slow, but gradual progress. But if you read the work of historians, Elizabeth Hinton, Khalil Gibran, Muhammad, and so many others. This 
uh, technocratic approach towards this topic actually looks more like this, a recycling of history. So I have a paper that I published in the East Chicago Law Review that looked at how the city of Chicago responded to the, its four largest homicide waves, just descriptive. And it was kind of eerie how similar the response was. So in the 20s, there was a backlash against black bootleggers and informal crime. Never mind the fact that you know Al Capone and the mob were running wild. But still, the problem was black, the black belt, black communities. In the 60s, civil rights activists. 2016, Laquan McDonald Act. It's like, you go on, it's, it's, it's the same. And what's happening, what happens during each crisis is that the new crew working in the evidence-based paradigm will come along and say, we haven't looked at data. These are our data tools. Erasing this history and advocating for this, but reproducing this. And I would argue that as all this is going on, there's nothing incremental about the way that criminal justice reforms are pursued generally. So what I'm talking about with the privatized police reform, for example, and the proliferation of those private firms selling policies, there's nothing incremental about that. And so this notion that social science should be inherently focusing on trying to advance incremental reforms totally misses the fact that there are whole other interventions that are happening in this space that are not incremental, that are totally getting off the hook. History teaches us that shifting this paradigm is going to be very hard and very painful. And one of the most useful uh, texts that I've read on this is this really great book that I would recommend you all to read on the history of cigarette, uh, on, on tobacco regulation. Uh, and so in the 40s and 50s, the tobacco industry funded physicians to appear in advertisements saying that cigarettes were perfectly safe, but also it funded a lot of the research on, on tobacco to create the appearance that tobacco was not, was not harmful. And you know, all, there was all these fights over it. And surprisingly, like one important note in this is that one of the constituents or one of the actors that was very much uh, in bed with the tobacco industry uh, and pushing back against paradigm shifts was, were psychologists because uh, psychological counseling was pitched by the tobacco industry as the solution to um, nicotine addiction. And the battle between phys like uh, physicians, medical researchers and psychologists were, got ugly. And it's, 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 that, it's that kind of battle that I think needs to be adopted more less than, than just the pure like, we're just all umpires calling balls and strikes at little things. Paradigm shifts, the paradigm shift ultimately upended psychology's monopoly on, on tobacco addiction treatment. And so that says, I'm not arguing for abandoning experiments. <laughs> so one of, the, one of the common questions I get, first question is like, so do we know nothing? Do we not pursue this stuff? No, of course not. Like, I think there's a place for evidence-based work for experiments. It's just, we have to operate with a different conception of science. We have, to, we have to move beyond positivism and think a little bit more with the constructivists leaning on the side of the science studies scholars. So Dr. Clarence Cook-Little featured in um, the Cigarette Century was a figure, a major scientific figure who published all these articles in the 30s and 40s saying tobacco was harmless. Ernest Winder was the first, uh, was, the, was the author, lead author of the first study published in 1950 that argued that smoking caused cancer. And I think what's really, really uh, powerful about this story is that for decades, the tobacco funded researchers were arguing that you couldn't say that, to, that smoking caused cancer because you haven't properly randomized. Because, because you, and not only properly randomized, but done a proper longitudinal study because smoking is not something that instantly gives you cancer, it gives you cancer over constant waves. And so enough physicians got wind of this and, and, and got together, funded by Prudential. Does anyone know what Prudential does? Life insurance. Life insurance, right? Because as cancer treatments were skyrocketing, so were Prudential's Prudential payouts. And so Prudential and the life insurance industry uh, funded the first studies linking smoking and cancer. But I think most crucially, brought together the editors of the journal, the American Medical Association to redefine the standard of causality in the study of tobacco's effects. 
that's the level of interventions and creative thinking that we need to adopt in, if, we, if we're serious about public, public safety innovation. And this positivism that I'm talking about, yeah, yeah. Last point is that without change, without pursuing what I'm putting forth here, is that social science is, social science is positioned to set up these public safety innovations to fail. And this really great article in, in, in The Trace um, highlighted how in Philadelphia, they invested public money, millions of dollars for the first time in violence prevention grant programs. And it required all of this documentation that the violence prevention organizations had to do for evaluation, that when the call went out in the subsequent year, um, a sizable portion of the, of the grantees didn't bother reapplying. Because the, the, the paperwork and the evaluation uh, burden uh, was too burdensome. And so without any change or seriously engaging with these problems and these barriers, we're just gonna be stuck to the repeating history. And if you want to take a look at any of the contracts, our data, or replicate anything that we've done here, it's the link to our GitHub that our email. Thank you all for listening. Um, thank you for the slides. We're gonna we're gonna use the microphone that Jesus keeps on I'll repeat the question. Okay. Um, so thank you for this talk. This was really interesting. And I'm wondering about, um, in terms of the disproportionate coverage of propaganda, of academic propaganda in the media, how much of that do you think is uh, academic journals intentionally seeding their papers and how much of it is just because the results are salient to people? Uh, especially people who are like against really progressive reforms. So I don't know definitively. I think that's part of it. Like I wouldn't go as far as to, I mean, I, I know from my administrative position that universities invest in PR firms to help generate news from their studies. And Philosophers like Stanley would argue that that's not inherently bad because, for example, if you have, you know, results from the, the trials of the COVID vaccine, like, that's something you want to hire PR firms to get out. So, so propaganda is not inherently bad. That's actually an argument that Stanley makes and one that I agree with. Um, I just think that, um, I, I think that what's really important is that, like, we don't live in an idea of meritocracy in the sense that like the most impactful, well-designed rigorous studies do not correlate with the most media coverage on a given topic. And when we think about regulations and interventions in this space, we don't think about it in those spaces. Like we're always focusing, what can we do in the black and brown community to make things better? It's like, we know actually part of what I think we should be doing here is asking questions like that. It's like, to what extent is this being driven by the nature of today's media, maybe journals need to be thinking a little bit about how they engage in media communications and these sorts of things. Because uh, by and large, I think it's an unregulated space. Yes. Uh, I forget what the numbers of the different studies were, so I'm just gonna kind of try to describe them. I find myself wanting a combination of two of the studies. The, <clears throat> the media mentions study, and then the later study uh, with the regression looking at- um, Innovations. Yeah, the innovations. Because um, to me, it's like, uh, so what that the Myrtle Beach uh, news station is covering this report, South Carolina is anyway a red state, so they're unlikely to have sure. to do these reforms. You know what I'm saying? Sure. Like. Yeah. Uh, so first of all, I guess, like, are you guys working on that study? Yeah. <laughs> if not, like, why not? Am I, am I missing something? Yeah, no, I mean, so I think part of, 
study three, which is the one on Lexapol and the private firms, is in part getting me to the so what. Like, oh yeah, no, the, the action is in these private firms, less so these, these propagandists. But um, these private firms do their own in-house research. So like they're like Lexapol for science will have their director of research, whose job is to do in-house evaluations. And what's what what is the the oil greasing wheels here is that it's like a retired cop doing evaluation, pitching to an audience and market of cops. <laughs> so it's like they're, they're operating on that trust. Uh, and because the, the the junk science coming into that world is like next level. And I haven't, I haven't even bothered covering it here. So you, you're right. You're right. Everything's fine. Another thing to think about with that, with the media mentioned study is like, there's, I mean, you sort of alluded yourself, like today's media, there's vastly different kinds of media out there. And just a, a media mention is not, all media mentions are not equal, I would argue. So if something is on CNN, that means some, something very, very different than if it's uh, in the Hyde Park Herald, <laughs> you know, just to, just to say, you know, uh, so I, I, I mean, because I work in media a bit, like I'm just kind of thinking like, about the actual impacts of these media mentions. Yeah, I mean, I, I, I think about that a lot. I'm trying to think about that as well. I mean, I, I wouldn't go as far as say that I think that these, you know, these studies are directly influencing policy because I'll just say that from folks that I know who work in close into that policing RCT world, a lot of the academics in that world actually feel like no one's listening even if they have media mentions, even though they're doing these RCTs, they're like, ah, oh, they're buying the Lexapol policy instead of doing my, what I recommended from this RCT. It's like, and, and so I think you're right that the, the media, the, it's still an open question, like what are the effects of this? But I think, you know, what I would hang my head on here is that it's, it's a question I think we should be pursuing as, as, part of a, as part of a research agenda, because I think it's embedded in a larger question, like, um, the role of cultural discourse in shaping people's perceptions of policing reforms. Because when I look at that training study and especially look at the media coverage in response to the killing of Dexter Reed, it was, I wanna say mechanical, like news coverage study, quote from officer or from like a police nonprofit saying that this is a training issue that can be addressed by training. We have studies to fix. And of one, but you know, we need different kinds of methods to systematically tackle that important question. So if I understand like your core argument properly, you're saying that uh, positive citizen doesn't work because we have junk science coming out. Right? No, positivism can't even live up to its ideals. So there's not an ideal world where we have better science being performed, better pipelines for data from, so you're saying that that's impossible to achieve. Yes. Can you go back over there? Yeah. So I I I think that um, a couple of things. So Naomi Oreskes is a great historian of science that argues that um, positivism should not be the ideal because industry seizes on positivism because positivism argue, kind of argues that researchers should be objective that they are pursuing universal truths, universal laws that apply and uh, that they should produce results that give the public certainty around what they're investing in. And what Oreskes argues is that that's not possible because all these studies have flaws. All of these studies have contractual arrangements that enable them to happen in the first place, which is true of tobacco, true of climate change, true of essentially any questions having to do with topics where there's an entrenched industry industry that has an incentive to co-opt the science of the topic. And so she argues that it's, it's, it's better to adopt a constructivist view because there with a the constructivist view, the scientists themselves are, an obje are a topic of study because you're talking, you're, you're looking at their contractual arrangements that mm -hmm. made the studies possible. You're holding them accountable, looking at their sources of funding and that gets us closer to a truth. So that's why you, you set up that point where you say, yeah, we need to get more activists involved so that we just at least rebalance this, the discourse. Broaden the notion of expertise. 
I would say, because activist is a loaded term. And I'll say one really powerful example of this is that I owe the work, like the, the like the, the attention to all this to the to the activists that ha I've engaged with because they were the ones that were like, oh, have you seen the contracts that these guys were like what? And when I talk about this with all of my colleagues, they're like, what? Like at least for for folks that don't work in the evaluation. When I talk to people in the evaluation, they're like, oh well, it, yeah, we operate with the no surprises policy. Like, oh, okay, like no surprises coming out of the evaluation. Like, do you teach that in evaluation? <laughs> mm -hmm. yeah. yeah, so thanks. I think uh so sympathetic to what you say, and I think in some ways you're you're too critical of the RCP people, but also not critical enough. And and my I get this is, all like, the time. <laughs> knowing a lot of those people as I do, um, and wearing that hat occasionally myself. It seems to me what they're really dedicated to above all else is randomization. And they'll study anything that you're in. And I do not believe for a second that there are people who are guided by a pro-police ideology who are saying like, oh, there's all this other kind of stuff that might lead to findings that are anti-police that sure. randomize and would make for a good study, but I'm not doing it because I sure. support the police. It's just like, give me something random and I'll figure out a question to ask about. <laughs> and so one, I think one of the things you're saying is that the power structures that control what can be randomized or not, sometimes include the police departments themselves. And so we don't get necessarily the opportunities to study the kind of things we might like to study if we have full access to the levels of organization. And so, and I, I think it's an interesting contrast to say with the world of development economics, where there seems to be lots more latitude than people have been able to randomize across a wide range of, you look in development economics, people have studied all kinds of approaches to say poverty, you know, um, and so I'm curious in your position, given that you say at the end, like maybe there's values in this kind of RCT approach, what's the RCT you would want to run if you could, that you think is being, that maybe it's just not possible given the power structures in place, but a reasonable good RCT that should be being done that isn't. See, I would, I get this question all the time. It was funny, as I was thinking like, what am I, how am I going to answer this if I get past this? It's like, I would want to know what community members want an RCT. I would want to know what community members want an RCT. <laughs> like, go to communities, teach experimentation, ask them what do they, what do they want an experiment. Well, I'm asking you. Right, but you're, you're, but part, like, okay, like, if I put my technocratic hat on for a second, I, I think that I would love to, Well, I guess I would love to randomly, I would love to do an RCT of any one of these private firms' uh, use of force manuals. And part of why I'm, I'm stuck on this is because, and why I think partly it's the wrong question, is that it would be impossible because these policies are the private property of these firms. And it's, it's their prerogative to be able to release, release that to me or not. So I guess that's it's kind of why I'm stuck is that things that I would want to do an RCT of, just by law, I cannot. Because of privatization. I'll give you, I'll give you another, an RCT of license plates readers. I sent an email to all of Asados about this, never responded, but like, because <laughs> the RCTs of license plates writers, there are very few of them, find no effect on crime. We've invested millions in license plates readers across the campus. And so I'm curious, where's, what are the logics of evidence there? And why is it that we as a university are investing millions in subjecting all sorts of social interventions to RCTs, but then not to the actual things that we think are actually reducing crime? So that's a way to answer your question. But again, like I, I, I'm, I'm with you though, that like, I don't think that the issue, and I didn't, I, I didn't intend to frame it this way, is about bad apple academics. I think it's in part like the incentive structure. Like our colleagues are rewarded for performing randomization on whatever they can perform the randomization on. Mm -hmm. they, and that is 
if, if, if we want to be serious, you, you mentioned like it's, it's, and I think it's more than just like what interventions like, I would argue it's the interventions that we need. And, you know, and at bare minimum, I want to get folks to be thinking about those kinds of things and trying to think about how to do things differently with these topics, because without it, we're just going to be continuing to do our RCTs on the things we can randomize. It's going to continue to produce these incremental changes. Uh, meanwhile, you know, whichever wealthy individual wants to disrupt this will disrupt this in the face of any kind of evidence that we're putting forth. And so in a way, I feel like we're being duped. Like us, we social scientists are being duped to, to follow funding streams, to randomize whatever we can randomize. And I think that if we actually look at this from an innovation project, we need, we need to be asking different questions. Yes. Um, Sorry. <laughs> um, so I'm involved with a project that Cook County has come to um, the Office of Civic Engagement with and said they got a lot of ARPA money and have funded 150 different violence prevention organizations. And they could have stopped there, but they said, you know, there should be some learning community that exists across these 150 orgs and came to our office to help design and run um, innovative ways through the arts and humanities to bring them through using the, something I can tell you more about called the Civic Actor Studio. Sure. Either. Yeah. Um, and so I wonder if there are whole, I guess I, my question to you is what do you think the role of a university could or should be to foster learning communities if that's what one, one thing we're good at in service of violence prevention innovation. I mean, to my knowledge, universities are doing so in various ways. I just think that, <laughs> I mean, if we stick with the University of Chicago, it gets complicated because for example, University of Chicago owns a firm called, or is partial owner of a firm called uh, uh, something analytics. Geo I'll find the name when I have it. Um, something, essentially an analytics firm whose job it is to produce algorithms that help police and that is a way of answering your question of that. In that context, I think it's limited what, we, what so, certain universities can do. Because if a university has a financial stake in producing a certain kind of outcome, they're not, not objective. In fact, it was so funny taking the annual conflict of interest training that we're required to take as faculty here. And I read, I was like, uh, it said something like, should like universities should not be pursuing research paradigms and that are, that are tied to things that they're heavily invested in. I thought to myself, that's strange, that's strange. <laughs> so I don't know, I, I, I don't think that there's a clear and cut answer there. I don't know, I, I, I don't think, I, I don't think universities are the sites for where these innovations happen because local progress by and large is being done outside of the realm of universities. As I try to inch and talk to them, they're like very much like stay, stay away from us. Um, and I think that's, that's a reflection of the extent to which most universities have uh, accepted certain kinds of donations that are oriented towards these innovations in a way that pouch them under police departments. So there is a there is a police academy here now that Crime Lab's running with the violence prevention angle. Yeah. And you know, they're running these things and it's a model that is looking at how police and violence prevention can work together. There's a lot of reasons, it's not the only model, but it's the one that our university happens to invest in and it's great. But, uh, and I'm also sure that if some donor wanted to donate an alternative kind of model. The university would be happy to accept it. We can have multiple police academy. One of the funny things about Mansueta when I got here was that there are like 20 million urban centers here, right? So like the university is always going to be happy to invest in other innovations, but you know, it's not uh, it's not quite clear how much these entities are talking about. I can take maybe one more question because I actually have to head to class after this. I think our time is. Will... 
Okay. So thank you for for saying it. Thank you.